Let's talk about the document-based question, or DBQ, of the AP European History exam. So remember how this works. You have one hour, 15 minutes to read, 45 minutes to write. You're going to be presented with seven documents. You have to use those seven documents to answer the question that they give you. The DBQ is a really challenging essay. It's always graded on a scale of zero to seven, and each one of the points is assigned in one of four categories, thesis, contextualization, evidence, and analysis and reasoning. Your job is to make sure that you earn as many points as you can within the hour that they give you. Let's take a look at a sample DBQ. Now, what's really nice about this, I can see right away on the page, is that they give me the rubric, basically, in the instructions. So it's good to always know the instructions in advance, but sometimes people like to read it again. So it says, in your response, you should do the following. You should respond to the prompt with a historically defensible thesis or claim that establishes a line of reasoning. So to earn the thesis point, I know what I need to do. I need to directly respond to the prompt, the prompt that they gave me, not some other prompt I made up or some other prompt I misinterpreted, but the specific language they've given me. I need a historically defensible thesis. I cannot say that Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas in 1792, right? It needs to be within the grounds of reality. And I need to finally establish a line of reasoning. That means I need to say, this happened because, and then give some valid reasons to support my claim. If I only put in my thesis statement just an assertion, just an answer to the question, I won't get the point. So that's the thesis point. I need to describe a broader historical context that's relevant to the prompt. That's the contextualization point. I need a broader historical context, not some throughout the ages big random pile of information, but something specifically that's historical context for the prompt. I need to support an argument in response to the prompt using at least six documents. So if I use six documents, I will get it with that first point for evidence because I'm responding to the prompt. The fourth bullet point says that I need to use at least one additional piece of specific historical evidence, something really concrete beyond the one that's found in the seven documents relevant to an argument about the prompt. So I need to make sure that I use some outside evidence at one point to try to get that point. For at least three documents, I need to explain how or why the document's point of view, purpose, historical situation, and or audience is relevant to an argument. So I need to go deeper into the documents, provide some what we call sourcing, some context for the documents that helps me get that point. And then I need to use evidence to corroborate, qualify, or modify an argument that addresses the prompt. So I need to show the complexity of my thinking to get these analysis and reasoning points. This is like a little checklist I can follow as I go throughout the essay. Now I'm going to go to the documents. Always at the top of the, the first main page, I'm going to get my question. This is a question I'm going to read multiple times. It says, evaluate whether European imperialism in the period from 1840 to 1914 was motivated primarily by economic or cultural concerns. So I like to read these questions a total of five or six times. I'm going to go back and read it a second. Evaluate whether, not to what extent, a lot of times it'll say to what extent. Things are a spectrum and you need to find your space on the spectrum. This says weather. Now that doesn't mean that you can't be on a spectrum as well, but you're identifying how you, you weigh these two factors. And remember the two factors here, they're economic or cultural concerns. So I need to figure out to what extent and whether it was economic or cultural concerns that motivated European imperialism, European expansion. And look at this unusual time period. It's 1840 to 1914. So 1914 is, of course, the beginning of World War I. That changes the rules of European imperialism permanently. 1840, okay, that's interesting because there's some second industrial revolution things kind of just starting up. There's um, I'm before the revolutions of 1848, so I'm paying attention to the time period. And now I'm going to go into the documents. I need to talk about what motivated Europeans to expand and set up their empires in the 19th century. Now as I work my way through the documents, what I'm doing is I'm always reading carefully about the sources. So this says, this was a paper agreed upon at a large public meeting in Canton, China. The people of Canton against the English, the year is 1842. 
Now the documents always move in chronological order, so sometimes you can find these nice chronological trends across the documents. I also want to pay attention as I'm reading the documents to where the document is. This is an unusual source for AP European history because it's in China. A lot of your documents, of course, are going to be based in the main subject of this course. But because it's about imperialism, we're taking this more global view. During the reigns of the emperors Qianlong and Qia King, these English barbarians humbly besought an instance and permission to deliver tribute and presents. They afterwards presumptuously asked to have Chu San, but our sovereigns, clearly perceiving their traitorous designs, gave them a determined refusal. From that time, linking themselves with traitorous Chinese traders, they have carried on a large trade and poisoned our brave people with opium. Oh, okay, so I remember the opium wars and um, this broader story about uh, English interventions related to opium. Verily, the English barbarians murder all of us that they can. They are dogs whose desire can never be satisfied. Therefore, we need not inquire whether the peace they have now made be real or pretended. Let us all rise, arm, and unite and go against them. So this is some, um, let's just say, anti-British call to action. And I like to write little notes to myself as I go through the documents in order to make sure that I, I don't forget what I'm reading as I go. One thing I am not doing is obsessing over every word. I don't say verily every day. I don't know about you guys, but verily is not a word that's in my vocabulary. Who cares what it actually means? Who cares what, uh, what is a chusan? Who doesn't matter, irrelevant, right? I'm trying to get points on this test, not know every word, not be convinced of my own knowledge. I've never read this source, I've never heard of it. Doesn't matter, I'm getting some things that I need. What about what motivated European imperialism? Economic or cultural concerns? So certainly there's some economic concern, maybe I'll, along the left-hand side here, I'll mark this up. It's an economic concern with the trade of opium. Okay, then I go to source number two. I'm moving quickly. I only have 15 minutes to read. This is John Stuart Mill. Okay, I've read him. On Colonies and Colonization, 1848. It says, the question of government intervention in the work of colonization involves the future and permanent interests of civilization itself and far outstretches the comparatively narrow limits of purely economical considerations. But even with a view to those considerations alone, the removal of population from the overcrowded to the unoccupied parts of the Earth's surface is one of those works of eminent social usefulness which most require and which at the same time best repay the intervention of government. This is very, this is confusing, right? I mean, there's a lot of words and long sentences and I'm running out of breath. I'm not worrying about that. I'm worrying about what I can use to answer the question. To appreciate the benefits of colonization, it should be considered in its relation, not to a single country, but to the collective economical interests of the human race, economic. Um, this is important. This document was put here for a reason. And one of the reasons it's put here, somebody's theorizing, Mill is theorizing in 1848, that there is the collective economical interests of the human race at stake. Now I have something I can grab onto when I'm building a case about the importance or lack of importance of economics. The question is in general treated too exclusively as one of distribution, of relieving one labor market and supplying another. It is this, but it is also a question of production and of the most efficient employment of the productive resources of the world. So is colonization, imperialism, about the most efficient employment of productive resources in the world? According to Mill, it is. So this is about, um, and I'm going to say it's about production and, what did he say? Uh, distribution of resources, we'll say. So whenever I end up arguing about the significance of, what did the question say? Economic or cultural concerns. Mill's an economics guy. That's my answer. I don't really see a lot of culture here. Now I'm in document three. It says, the source is Dadabai Nauroji, The Benefits of British Rule. It's 1871. It's a lot later than my sources from the 1840s. Here's what it says. It says, in the cause of civilization, education, both male and female, Though yet only partial, an inestimable blessing as far as it has gone, and leading gradually to the destruction of superstition and many moral and social evils. Resuscitation of India's own noble literature, 
modified and refined by the Enlightenment of the West. So this is something about, this is clearly something cultural at first. And I see that education is important, including the education of females. And the uh, Enlightenment of the West is affecting literature. Politically, peace and order, freedom of speech and liberty of the press. So imperialism brings peace and order, higher political knowledge and aspirations, improvement of government in the native states, security of life, so increased security, more benefits of, of imperialism, freedom from oppression caused by the caprice or greed of despotic rulers, and from devastation by war, equal justice between man and man, sometimes vitiated by partiality to Europeans, services of highly educated administrators who have achieved the above mentioned results. So, Okay, I get the cultural part. I get this part about, um, let's just say, peace and order. I like that as the kind of headline here. Um, or actually, I don't want to put that there. I want to put that here, keep my notes consistent. And it says materially, loans for railways and irrigation, development of a few valuable products such as indigo tea, coffee, silks, uh, silk, etc., increase of exports, telegraph. So this is economic. I have both in this source. To sum up the whole, the British rule has been morally a great blessing. Politically, peace and order on one hand, blunders on the other. Materially, impoverishment relieved as far as the railway and other loans go. The natives call the British system Sakar Ki Churi, the knife of sugar. That is to say, there is no oppression. It is all smooth and sweet, but it is the knife notwithstanding. I mention this to you that you should know these feelings. Our great misfortune is that you do not know our wants. When, you will, when, will you know our, when you will know our real wishes, I have not the least doubt that you will do justice. The genius and spirit of the British people is fair play and justice. This source is kind of confusing. It feels like it's contradictory. I'm not going to sort out the contradiction because I don't need it. I need it to answer the question I'm moving along. Document four. Letter published by British missionary John G. Patton of the New Hebrides Mission in 1883. So it's this later time period. I also notice he's a missionary. So I'm already, I'm actually just going to write down cultural. Right, one key motive of imperialism was the spreading of Christianity around the world, both in the 1500s and in the 1800s. That's a theme. Let's see if the missionary talks about anything economic, though. The 13 islands of this group, on which life and property are now comparatively safe, the 8,000 professed Christians on the group, and all the churches formed from among them are, by God's blessing, the fruits of the labors of British missionaries, who at great toil, expense, and loss of life have translated, got printed, and taught the natives to read the Bible in part or in whole in nine different languages of this group. Well, 70,000 at least are longing and ready for the gospel. And we fear all this good work would be lost if the New Hebrides fall into other than British hands. Well, this is really interesting. It's not just about having people read the Bible. It's about other non-British colonial powers. So there is some political competition I'm going to put here as well. This is not just about missionary efforts. It's about British missionary efforts. And that seems to be an important theme here. It says, for the above reasons and others that might be given, we sincerely hope and pray that you will do all possible to get Victoria and the other colonial governments to help and unite in urging Great Britain at once to take possession of the New Hebrides group, whether looked at as in the interests of humanity or of Christianity or commercially. So he's kind of lumping them in together, Christianity or commercially or politically. Sure, it is most desirable that they should at once be British possessions. This is interesting. We have a cultural and political and now even an economic factor. Let's take a look at document five. It's Jules Ferry, speech before the French Chamber of Deputies. So we shifted away from Britain into France. We've shifted to 1884. We're in this late period. The policy of colonial expansion is a political and economic system that can be connected to three sets of ideas, economic ideas, the most far-reaching ideas of civilization, and the ideas of a political and patriotic sort. Gentlemen, we must speak more loudly and more honestly. We must say openly that indeed the higher races have a right over the lower races. I repeat that the superior races have a right because they have a duty. They have the duty to civilize the inferior races. But in our time, I maintain that European nations acquit themselves with generosity, with grandeur, and with sincerity of the superior civilizing duty. So here I've got clearly a cultural concern um, because this is about racial supremacy. So one of the features here is 
racial supremacy. And I can think of, and I'll keep the notes over here, The White Man's Burden, the famous poem by Rudyard Kipling. I can also think of the Mission Civilisatrice, which I can't spell, but I'll do it like this. And I'm going to write about this. This is the French ideology of, of saving the world through uh, building a, an imperial regime, spreading light without acting and without taking part in the affairs of the world, keeping out of all European alliances and seeing as a trap and adventure all expansion into Africa or the Orient for a great nation to live this way, believe me, is to abdicate and in less time than you may think to sink from the first rank to the third and the fourth. So ultimately it's about, in this source, cultural, there's a political dimension as well. Finally here, I've got the last two documents. Document six is F.D. Lugard's The Rise of Our East African Empire, 1893. Beyond doubt, I think the most useful missions are the medical and the industrial in the initial stages of savage development. So this is economic. And a combination of the two is, in my opinion, an ideal mission, as the skill of the European in medicine asserts its superiority over the crude methods of the medicine man, so does he in proportion gain an influence in his teaching of the great truths of Christianity. So this is cultural. It's not just medicine, it's about religion as well. He teaches the savage where knowledge and art cease, this more culture, how far natural remedies produce their effects, independent of charms or supernatural agencies, and where divine power overrules all human efforts. Such demonstration from a medicine man, whose skill they cannot fail to recognize as superior to their own, has naturally more weight than any mere preaching. A mere preacher is discounted, and his zeal is not understood. The medical missionary, moreover, gains an admission to the houses and homes of the natives by virtue of his art, which would be not be so readily accorded to another. He becomes their advisor and referee, and his counsels are substituted for the magic and witchcraft which retard development. The value of the industrial mission, on the other hand, depends, of course, largely on the nature of the tribes among whom it is located the sinking of wells, the system of irrigation, the introduction and planting of useful trees, the use of manure and of domestic animals for agricultural purposes, the improvement of his implements by the introduction of the primitive Indian plow, etc. All of these, while improving the status of the native, will render his land more productive and hence, by increasing his surplus products, will enable him to purchase from the trader the cloth which shall add to his decency and the implements and household utensils which shall produce greater results for his labor and greater comforts in his social life. So I can see from document six that I have a really strong argument about production, about technology. This reminds me of what I saw in document two. So I'm just gonna double check I have the right document here. Go up, I think this was Mill here. Yes, who talked about production. So I'm gonna also mark here that I'm linking it to document six. Whenever you link the documents, mark both of them with that connection. So two and six are gonna end up kind of lumped together into a nice group. Um, and then I have document seven. Here's my first and only image of the set. Normally you're gonna get um, at least one, sometimes two images or maps. This is a cartoon. It says, in the rubber coils, from the Congo Free State Punch, which is an English magazine from 1906. This is my latest source. And I see here, it looks like it says, in the rubber coils, the Congo Free State, and then I see a man, an African man, wrapped in coils of a snake, which is the rubber coils. And then I see this, this looks like a white imperial face. So. I'm gonna mention the race issue again, potentially here. Um, this certainly has an economic component to it because rubber, like opium, like silk, is one of these things that people are trading. Um, I see this person in the back is fearful. Um, I see this is uh, you know, an image of death and destruction. I'm gonna see if there's anything else I can get out of this. And, and one of the things I would wanna do at this point is pay attention to the clock. So I've got 15 minutes for the documents. In theory, I could go start writing as soon as I'm ready, but I'm not ready yet. I have a lot of work to do in trying to earn the points. So what I've done with these seven documents is I've read the list of directions again to remind me of the rubric. Then I looked at the prompt and I read it closely. 
Then I read the documents. Notice that as I was reading the documents, my focus wasn't so much on reading for pleasure or what I knew about the documents. The focus was on what can these documents tell me about economic or cultural factors. That's why in the left-hand margin, I marked where economic and cultural factors came in. So I still have a lot of work to do, but now I'm ready to begin planning my essay and earning each of the points.